This video is brought to you by Squarespace, but we're going to talk about that a bit later. So imagine that we have two points, we'll call them A and B, and we know that the shortest distance between them is basically a straight line, where the distance of it's given by the Pythagorean theorem, we know how this works. But what if we didn't know that a straight line was the fastest? All we know is that the distance metric is this Pythagorean theorem. How would we know that it's a straight line and not like some curvy thing? Well, what we can do is with this curved path, we can put a bunch of points on it and between every two points evaluate using our distance metric, which will give us a overall distance of the path, and then we can take it and iterate, like just put a bit of noise on it, calculate the distance. If it's smaller, then it must be a better path. And then we iterate again. If this new path is a smaller distance, it must be better. And when we do this over and over and over again, we will converge to the straight line. On the other hand, we could distort this thing and the distance gets longer, right? We're not guaranteed a better solution. So we just test things until one of them is smaller. So in this case, the blue path seems to be uh, optimal, or at least better than our original path. Well, what if our distance metric was different? We're taking a cubed root, or we change some of the powers, or we change the equation entirely. Imagine that it's six. In the case that it's six, every single path, doesn't matter what it is, is of equal length. That would imply a point's distance to itself is six, so it's not an actual metric. If instead of minimizing length, we're trying to minimize surface area and we have some boundary, then we can evaluate by doing variations which one minimizes surface area. And it just so happens that a bubble or like soap or whatever mimics this behavior. So our initial setup is going to be starting with a curve. And the whole point is it doesn't matter how wild this curve is, as long as it has a start point and an end point, and we have a metric, in this case being the Pythagorean theorem, uh, we will converge on a straight line being the straightest path. Add a bit of resolution. So first thing I need to do is take this curve and like sample it or break it up into like 100 points. So take this, resample it into, I don't know, maybe like 150 points. Next, I need to know the length of this curve that's evaluated at every kind of like gap in these uh, vertices. There is a node for this for a standard uh, Euclidean geometry metric. So this will give us the curve length. And now we just need a way to iterate on this curve and check every time is it better. Well, to iterate, all I'm going to do is I'm going to distort it a bit. So set position, this is going to let me move it. And for my purposes, I'm just going to use a noise texture, which we can center going from zero to one to negative 0.5 to 0.5, connect that to the offset. And there you go, we have a uh, distorted curve. Now, one thing to note is if we have this on the XY plane specifically, we want our deformation to also be on the XY because any movement into the Z axis in either direction will add length. So we could either kind of constrain it or even better is I'm going to have my curve also be in 3D space. Let's have our deformation be less intense. And for the four dimensional, we can change the deformation on every single frame. So this is going to be dependent on the frame number. In other words, what I want is some kind of loop, whether that be a temporal loop or a repeat zone or whatever, where I input in our curve. And then for every iteration, I do this kind of like set positioning, which I can turn into a node group, control G, let's call this deformation. I run the curve through our deformation. And I also want to evaluate the uh, curve length on this deformation, but we also need the initial sample. So in other words, we start with our curve, we input it into the sim zone, and then we calculate the length of it. And then also the length of it when we do a modification and given which one is smaller, we will pass it through. So assuming that the new one is less than the old one, in that case, what we need to do is we need to switch over to the new iteration. But it's shrinking into the middle, which kind of makes sense. If it's trying to minimize distance at the end, it will shrink to a single point. Uh, we do technically have a boundary constraint where we're saying our initial two endpoints shouldn't be moving. Otherwise, of course, it's going to compress. So for our deformation, for this uh, set position, we want to do it for everything except for the endpoints, which is nice that we have a curve because I can say here are the endpoints, here's the inverse, so everything except for the endpoints and do it for that selection. So now if I play this over time, time, you can see it's starting to become more and more of a straight line. Again, all it's doing is it's doing a deformation saying, is that distance smaller? If so, keep it and iterate on it. You see, if I hit bake, it goes through that pretty much instantly. Uh, you can see as it goes through this, it converges quite quickly onto a straight line because that is the uh, fastest. Now, one thing to note is that this process should be universally true for no matter what curve we start with. So let's say we had something like really obnoxious. If we run the simulation, let's have it go for a few thousand steps. When we scrub through this, you can see it still kind of stabilizes on what will be after enough time a uh, straight line. So it does not matter. You can have loop-de-loops. -loops. Like, th th there is only one fastest way between uh, two points. But, you know, we, we already knew that this was the case. What about a situation where we don't know what the shortest path is? So let me give you an example. Instead of having kind of like a curve on the XY plane or even a bit three-dimensionally, let's have this be kind of like on a hill or uh, some kind of terrain. So I'm going to make like a mountain here, maybe a valley here. You can use the uh, draw feature and then click a surface to actually say we go from here to here. So now we have a nice curve that has a start point and a end point. But clearly the best way to get from here to here isn't going over the mountain. You kind of want to go around it. The only thing I need to change is that every time we deform this, right? So if I have my curve and then I do a deformation, I have to make sure that this deformation remains on the surface of the thing to be a valid path. In other words, for every single step, I always have to sample the nearest surface of the terrain object. So make sure to calculate the terrain object for the nearest surface point. I just want to extract the position. So where is the nearest point on the surface for whatever that answer is, take that curve point and snap it to it. So here you can see immediately we get a, a 
curve that's actually on the surface. I'll call this a step right here, something like snapping. And then the important thing is after we do our deformation, we got to make sure to snap and then resample and all this. Okay, survey says that this is actually the most optimal path to get from one point to another, which is very different from how we started off going like over the mountain, for example. If you wanted to optimize this in a very real world scenario, you're not just trying to minimize distance, uh, but you're also trying to minimize kind of the angle or the steepness that you're walking up. And if you include that into your metric, which you can, it would probably decide to go kind of like around this entire thing, um, which makes sense. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is a place to make beautiful websites easily. At this point, I have multiple websites made with them, but one of my new ones is text, txt.fan, where you can have like a text box experience with particles and all this, just something I thought was cool. And this is possible because Squarespace has a bunch of features. The first of which is HTML code injection. Just paste that right in there, Squarespace hosts it. Number two, I get to see who is coming to this website, analytics information. And then third of all, if I was to sell something on this website, I don't know what that would be, but if you want to make some kind of digital store or something, Squarespace accepts pretty much every kind of payment under the sun. So once you've made your website and you're ready to take that thing live, you can use my link in the description to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. But now what about the bubble scenario that has the surface area? Well, it's basically the same thing, but now we're adding a dimension. So let's start off with the simple case. So let's do something like this. I'm going to delete some of the faces here. We basically have this boundary that we're going to dip into soap. And because the soap needs to deform in the sense of surface area, I'm going to subdivide it a couple times. And then for the boundary, I can just say select boundary loop. And then I'm going to control G to assign a vertex group. We can call this border. And now we have some vertices that belong to the border that do not move in the same sense that when we were trying to optimize our curve, the start and the end point were constrained. Either way, our setup should be pretty similar. I mean, all we're doing is we're going to distort this thing. But then uh, unlike before, where we had a convenient metric for us, this uh, curve length that will measure the arc length, uh, we need a way to calculate a uh, total surface area. So let's actually start with that. To calculate total surface area, all you need to do is take every single polygon, get its area, and then we just add it up for every single kind of like face on here. We do have this face area node. I can now use attribute statistic to calculate the area of this mesh, making sure to evaluate the area on the faces. And now this sum right here, which I'm going to send through a math node just so I can uh, make it a node group, this can be total surface area. And really our deformation function, like how is it going to vary every time and we check if it's better or worse, can also be the same deformation as before. So let's actually bring that in here. But now the difference is we're not just going to constrain the endpoints, but we're going to constrain the whole boundary. So for named attributes, select a border, and we are going to set position for everything except the borders. Again, we're doing this inversion. Now a big difference is we don't have this kind of like resample curve or like make this continuous and smooth kind of situation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to artificially put this into deformation, set position, and then I'm going to take that position. So right now I'm casting it to itself, but I'm just going to add a tiny bit of blur to kind of mimic continuity in a sense, just smooths things out a little and make sure to constrain the boundary. And now all we have to do is basically use the same iteration setup. So initially we put in our surface and then for every iteration, we run a deformation. For that deformation, we calculate the total surface area along with the total surface area of the initial. I'm then going to compare these two to ask which one should I keep? So is this deformed one kind of a smaller metric in some sense? Does it have a smaller surface area than the original? And if that is the case, we are going to pass that through. See, it's doing something. It's doing something here. And let's let that run for many iterations. In fact, this is going to be equally fast to our curve. Like there's still not much geometry. And you can see it kind of converges to this shape right here, which you might notice looks oddly familiar. It looks very similar to what happens in real life. Uh, let's add a bit of geo so it can be a bit more accurate here. You can simulate real world phenomena just with this basic principle of minimizing energy, whether that be surface area or arc length or uh, whatever. Okay, so it's doing its deformation. And then as it gets towards the end, of course, it's going to be more precise as we run it for longer. Again, it converges on this exact same shape. But the beauty of this is it's a general setup. So I can just change the boundary at any point. So for example, I'm going to take this torus and maybe get rid of the bottom faces. And then for all of this, I'm going to select boundary loop. This is going to be our uh, new boundary. If you were to put soap here, how would you minimize surface area? Well, it would be just kind of outlining a two dimensional torus, right? As if we were looking at this like straight on and it was flat. All this extra curvature here is adding surface area that we could just compress kind of like this uh, to the Z plane. Uh, the results will speak for themselves. So it's deforming. It's going to keep deforming. And we might want to add more uh, geo here. But you can see it's starting to flatten out. That's for sure. Okay, so I did a few thousand frames here. And you can see indeed it's converging to a flat disk. And by frame 10,000, it's pretty much flat. Let's do one more setup. That might be a bit more interesting. For this one, let me start off with maybe a cylinder that I'm going to smooth out. So maybe like 100 vertices. And I'm just going to add a loop cut in the middle. Let's actually disable this modifier so we can see what we're doing. Okay. And then we're going to get rid of the top and bottom. So the boundaries are going to be kind of these uh, three rings. Let's add some geometry here and some geometry here. And I'm going to say our boundaries should be this loop, this loop, and then also this loop. Let's enable our modifier and see how it kind of decides to converge here. Let's simulate. So this one, there isn't like much room to shrink, right? It basically makes kind of this saucer shape, uh, but it is cool that it can minimize surface area on its own. Okay, last stress test. Here we have kind of like two triangles in a corner and the boundary is pretty much what you would expect. I'm going to run 
run the simulation and let's see what we get. Okay, it does this kind of rounding out thing that seems pretty familiar and we get a shape like this that wouldn't be necessarily obvious on how to model kind of like perfectly. So hopefully you learned something from this. I know it's very like, what's the use of it kind of thing, but I thought it'd be cool to implement. I learned about calculus of variations a long time ago and never implemented it in anything. So it was cool to do that. Goodbye.